I've helped thousands of people and got them to this place where wherever they're at, they can look in the mirror and find a connection to themselves again. And that always comes from within. And it comes from, you know, exploring the unfelt emotions, handling the expression of where their pain may be. Katie, Katie, let it out. And today is another one in my series, Highlight Detroit, because this person lives locally here in Detroit with me. Her name is Renee Heigl. She's a friend of mine, as you'll hear in this episode, and we recorded this a couple of months back, so you'll hear some old school references to the name of my old blog and podcast, which was The Wellness Wonderland. And it's a great conversation, tangential as usual. We cover parenthood. She's a mother. We talk about wellness and body image and trying new experiences, getting out of your comfort zone. She's a really wonderful, beautiful woman that I'm so happy that I know and that you will get to know momentarily. So another thing we mentioned in this episode is Audible because Renee, as a busy mom, loves audiobooks and so do I. I'm not a busy mom. I am busy, but I'm not a mom yet or maybe ever. I don't know. Anyway, the point is I like audiobooks and I really like Audible. So if you haven't checked it out, go to the link in the podcast show notes or just click on your telephone device where you're listening and you can get a free one on me if you've never tried it before. So might as well, right? It's free. Anyway, that's what I have to say about that. Audible is so great for being a sponsor of the podcast. Thank you. And Other ways you can support the show, as usual, share it with a friend, share it with maybe a mother, someone you think would find it interesting, fascinating, helpful, share it with them. It helps me grow the show, and that's what I really want to do, you guys. I want to grow the show so I can keep doing it, I can do it more often, I can do it better, really want to do it better, I think I can do it better, I think I can have on, not that my guests aren't awesome, but I just want to have more awesome guests on, and I want to be able to prepare more and spend more time on it and edit it better and just do all sorts of cool bells and whistles to this podcast. So if you want to support that, A, you can donate to the podcast. There's a place to do that. My assistant Amanda restructured that page so it's super simple and easy to navigate, and you can just do it through PayPal. It takes like two seconds. But if you don't want to spend any money, you can support the show through Amazon. I'm an Amazon affiliate, so if you shop through my link to Amazon, as you normally would, Amazon actually throws a couple pennies our way to keep the podcast going. So that's another way you can support the show. Again, just sharing it really helps. It helps to subscribe. Actually hitting that subscribe button gives the show a high five and helps more people find it because it moves things up in the iTunes algorithm of sorts. I don't really understand it, but all I know is sometimes we're in the top 150, sometimes we're not, sometimes we're like 100, sometimes we're like 99. One time, one time we were. It was really cool. I took a screenshot. And another time, we were like 127, which was also really cool. But it would be really cool (laughs) if we were consistently in that go around of podcast roundups on the iTunes charts because it helps people find the show and it means a lot to me to have lots of people listening because it helps me to make more friends in more cool places. So join the Facebook group so you can listen to the show with your friends and talk about it with your friends. And I love you guys. Share it, subscribe, leave a review. I think I maybe mentioned that. I mention it all the time. Every podcast you listen to probably mentions it. But I just want to say it's a big week for podcasts in general. My friend from college just launched a new podcast called Undone. I had to think about what it was called for a second. It's so good. Her name's Emmanuel Barry. She's a producer on the show. Check it out. It's on the Gimlet Network, and I'm so proud of her. I love the show. There are so many good podcasts. What else are you guys listening to? I love you. Thank you for listening to my show when there are so many fantastic options out there, and I can't wait to talk to you guys next week. All right, I'm in a really happy, giddy mood, so hopefully that comes across. I'm going to go hang out with some friends now. Love you. Bye.
Welcome back, everyone, to the podcast. I'm so excited because my friend Renee is in the Wellness Wonderland. She's a health coach and one of the coolest, most down-to-earth, real people that I've met, and she lives right by me. So we get to actually hang out in person, which is fantastic. So thank you so much for being here, Renee, and I'm so excited to have everyone hear your story and hear how cool you are and love you as much as I do. Thank you. I'm so happy I'm here, especially with you. This is awesome. Yay. So let's introduce you. I know you, but for everyone listening, let's introduce you a little bit and then we'll flesh out your story a little more. But now you're a health coach and you help so many women do so many different things through your work. And you're also just one of the like I was saying before, you know, you're you're a mom, you're one of the most down-to-earth people, you do things out of your comfort zone. We were just chatting before this call about how you really make an effort to do things that are outside of your comfort zone, like rock climbing and ice skating and just trying new activities. <laughs> we went to, like, the coolest party downtown Detroit for your hairdresser, like, a couple months ago, where there was, like, performance art and cool lights and lots of makeup, and it was so fun, and... I that's one thing I love about you. So were you always this way? Where did you always know that you wanted to help women this way and put yourself out there in this way and do things outside of your comfort zone? Take us back and bring us up to where you are now. Great question. Yeah. So yes and no. I don't know that I always knew what it was or what the path was, but I I often felt as a young girl that I was supposed to do something different right like I you know how in school there's all the cliques mm-hmm. I had friends in all the cliques yeah I really <laughs> and that so yeah much. yeah and I just felt like I love all these people um and you know not that there wasn't your typical dramas and things of that nature but there there to me was always this alignment with okay there's gonna be something here that I'm supposed to do that's really important or unique and at the same time, back then, I was also just dabbling with all kinds of stuff from, you know, the drugs to the foods to <laughs> and anything that would kind of pull me into a different altered state, so to speak. And I even tried meditation back then, but I didn't know anything about it. So it was a very brief encounter. And it's funny you say this because my sister, just about a week ago, we were having a conversation. She called me for advice. And... I said something about love yourself to her, which is part of the brand of my business now. And she goes, oh my gosh, Renee, you've always been that way. She goes, do you remember when you were 14 and I was 16 and you made me stand in front of the mirror and tell me that I love myself? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I was like, I don't, I I totally don't, didn't remember that. And so it was a neat thing when someone in your life reminds you of who you used to be back then. And so Obviously, at 14, I had some of an inkling of some of this stuff, but didn't know what to do with it. That's so interesting because that's so on brand for you now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it took you a while to get back to that. So then so then, bring us up to the present a bit. So you had that inkling when you were younger, and then what is it that you do now, and how did you – come to you know your brand now which I love love yourself naked is like your slogan your brand your tagline which is so beautiful so how did you come up with that and how did you get from that 14 year old girl to where you are now yeah thanks that 14 year old girl got a job at Dairy Queen at that age and she loved sugar and um you know the long and short of it was by 16 I had high cholesterol and I was just I loved soda and cigarettes and and marijuana and all of that and so throughout the course of my life and I was just noticing and I, I wouldn't have ever said this back then but looking back I was reaching outside of myself to find fulfillment so there was some hole you know and I was trying to fill it with everything I could and what you know slowly started happening is my health broke down and, you know, at 17, 18, I had migraines and bad allergies and I was always sick. I was the girl who was always on some medication or some allergy medicine. And then I got shingles at age 19. And, you know, it, it just got worse and worse. And so 
basically you hit the bottom. And what is interesting is for me, it was vanity kind of, <laughs> it was, I never cooked much and it's not that my mom didn't try, you know, she really did, but I just didn't like anything having to do with the kitchen. And so I was on this beach at age 19. I had started a business at that age, which was quite young. So I'm in college, I'm running a business, I'm traveling all around the world and I'm hiding under my beach cover up feeling shame at how I look and checking out the hot girls walking by, wanting to look like them, right? And one of my friends sitting next to me looked amazing, and I asked her what she did, and she's like, I did this cleanse. And at that age, it's the first time I ever really heard of a cleanse, and I had zero confidence that I would pull it off because I knew I didn't cook. But anyway, I decided I'm going to try it, and I went home, I tried it, and in, you know, the same story most people hear, 14 days later, I felt amazing. And it wasn't this quick fix, okay, everything's great then, <laughs> but it was that was the catalyst for me. I actually felt so great in my body. My migraines turned to more like headaches, and <laughs> I figured, okay, there's something here. And that catapulted me to a six-year journey of, oh my goodness, like, all, you know, I, I started, I became a life coach at age 23. Um, I started my own organic garden, I started learning how to feed myself, eventually went to nutrition school through all that, healed a lot of my hormones, and I, I was told I couldn't have kids by a couple of the doctors because I had stopped ovulating, I would stopped having a period, and so I fixed that, I have a six-year-old son, and it really brought me to this place from the business that I was running, which was cool, you know, it was like marketing sales, and then I did PR. And I liked it, but I knew that I needed to do something to help people feed themselves because I was feeding myself in all the wrong ways for so long. And I started, I started on this new journey of, of health. And the love piece, loving yourself, to answer that question, my first three clients. So one of them was a younger woman who looked like Selma Hayek, and she, I, she was like in her twenties, and she looked like beautiful and hot body and voluptuous and she was just married and we were working together and she was talking about this pool her and her husband have in their yard and I go oh my god you can skinny dip and she's like no way and I, I learned from her that she was afraid to be naked in front of her brand new husband and I thought my mind gosh with that body how could you and so I knew that for her and I that was the part of the journey that we were going to be on together as her coach. I, I got to help her love herself and her body. And then the other client I had, she was about 75 pounds overweight, married for 30 years, hate, couldn't even walk past a mirror and look at herself, hated her body and lack of intimacy in her relationship and all of that. So again, another example of somebody who wanted so badly to love themselves in their body to look in the mirror, but to also on a soul level so they could get connection with people. And then my third client was a woman who was in her early 70s and she had an eating disorder. And so her pain was her entire life basically of a struggle with eating and with food and her body and image. And so you take these three completely different people who all want the same thing. And I remember going to this conference and telling people, I think I'm going to call my business Love Yourself Naked. And I got a lot of different kinds of reactions. <laughs> but it was, it was catchy enough and it spoke very clearly to not only I want to like what I look like in the mirror, but I also want to feel a sense of wholeness, which was really the journey that I had been on for so long. So... That brings us here. Yeah. Seven years now. I think I've been, yeah, seven years anniversary this year in business. That's so. great. I love that. I think it's important that I like the double meaning to love yourself naked. Like, I like how it can mean obviously the physical body and the naked body that, you know, we have, but it also is like loving yourself without your masks, without the mask you put onto the world or who you're trying to be or who society wants you to be, loving your naked self for who you truly are without all of that. Yeah. And um, that's what really stands out to me about 
your brand and what you do. And, and I, I want to pick up on, on something else that you said there, which was, you know, it's not about a cleanse. It's not about the food. It's about all of these other aspects of your life. And I know we've had many conversations about this off mic about, you know, the fact that, and you know, you know, that body image is something that we talk about a lot on this podcast and how, you know, it isn't just about making your body what you want it to be because that's fleeting and that's changing and there's aging and different life stages where our bodies will change. So it's about making your life as a whole really great. So can you talk about your journey with body image and really embracing that and what you've seen in your clients? Yeah, absolutely. What's interesting, this has come up, I wanted to start here. I'll start in the now versus in the, in the foreground, but I, I won't say where I was, but I get some cool opportunities to do some neat speaking gigs and and be in places where there's uh, you know doctors and uh, influential business individuals and things like that and I've had this happen to me I don't know now five or six times and I'm sure it's happened a lot more than I'm unaware of where I have shared the name of Love Yourself Naked you know my my website's like reneeheigl.com so it's not like when people go there they're always expecting to see this naked word but there's then one particular case this one woman came up to me and she's like she was a medical doctor and she goes oh my god honey that's horrible a horrible name I can't, you need to change the name of your business that's horrible and she what? wouldn't stop <laughs> and this was in a public setting with a lot of other people around and I just kind of stood there and listened to her and let her finish <laughs> and in my mind I knew that she was the ideal client she was the one that probably needed mm. the the message more than anyone, but she she had a lot of blocks, or she just couldn't get there yet. And uh, you would kind of piggybacking on what you said about wearing the masks, and so the name nakedness. There's a lot of different meaning in there, isn't it? <laughs> and yeah. and you know, people are like, "Is that a porn site?" And you know, I laugh. I think that's always funny when I hear that. But there's there's something in our culture where we have this association with the naked body, which I think is a whole other separate conversation, so I won't go too deep here, but where it's, um, you know, even think the breastfeeding conversation. Are they tits? And this is my, you know, tits to flaunt in my bra so you can see me on Instagram, or are they nursing breasts? Maybe they're both. I don't, you know, I'm not here to solve that problem necessarily, but the association when we come back to our body is very, very important where we can feel connected to it on a soulful level. And when I find, you know, in this case, this woman, if someone feels really, really disconnected from their body, they'll probably be very triggered by hearing love yourself naked. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I don't love myself clothed, let right. alone naked. <laughs> and it's something I can really, really relate to. But I've helped thousands of people and got them to this place where wherever they're at, they can look in the mirror and find a connection to themselves again. And that always comes from within. And it comes from, you know, exploring the unfelt emotions, handling the expression of where their pain may be. It, it, it all, you know, the food obviously makes a, a, a huge impact. If somebody, like my past, I'm binging on tons of sugar all the time, and I'm feeling the guilt and shame after doing it, there's no way I'm going to stand in front of a, a mirror or even in my outfit clothed and like how I look because I'm too stuck in that thought of I hate myself for just eating, you know, a whole bowl of ice cream times 10 or something, right? So, yeah, for me, you know, I've had a lot of different iterations of my body and I keep coming back to... Uh, and I'm going to give just a couple examples. One is there's moments where I will almost use it as a meditation where I'll sit with myself in front of a mirror and it may be naked, it might be clothed, preferably naked though. And I just look in my eyes and that's, that's a step one, you know, where you really, really just connect with yourself. Sometimes you can talk and say, hey, I love you. I appreciate you. 
And that can be a really, really emotional first step. And for a lot of my clients, taking that step sometimes is really challenging. So that, that might be a goal for some people to work up to. And for some people, it might be the first step. And, you know, I mean, I remember one specific moment when uh, I, I was quite young. I had a, uh, my belly button always stuck out. It was like the Audi belly button. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And a lot of people are like, oh, it's so cute, you know. But then when you get to the age and you're going to the beach with your girlfriends and there's guys there and you're, you know, a new teenager and you're in a bikini, now all of a sudden I'm the one that has the weird looking belly button. And people would make comments and and all of those different types of things. I remember having like an ingrown hair by my bikini line. And these are simple little examples, you know. I mean, there's, of course, cellulite and there's different roles and (laughs) so many different things. But as a young kid, coming back to what those core stories are of what did we think about ourselves? What did we learn? And then how do we, how do we allow that to affect us in our present day life? That's a really important step to take, really get clear on that. Yeah. And really just releasing, you know, years of maybe, pent up you know negative thoughts we've had about ourselves and learning to let those go little by little by little yeah and I think that's really fantastic for for what you do and and how you're helping people and then knowing too that it's it's not about the weight you know it's not about losing the weight and that's not necessarily going to change anything if it does happen so it really is about actually loving yourself regardless of the weight whether the weight comes off or not it doesn't really matter it's about feeling okay with yourself and accepting where you are today and I think that that's just a really important point I want people to hear and take away from this absolutely and for some people that they hear that I love how you put that and I agree and the there's a paradox there because for some people are like no but Renee it really is about the weight coming off because <laughs> there's so for a lot of people they haven't gotten the paradigm that when there's a self acceptance and it's really this is really about growing your self esteem if we were to put it in really simple terms like growing your self esteem is a way for you to feel this confidence that comes from being uh, happy I don't even know I don't want to use the word happy uh, a state of inner peace, because we're not always happy, are we? <laughs> but a state of inner peace with where you are right now. And where you are right now, I mean, I've, I've spoken a lot with Gilda's Club and people who have, you know, are in recovery from cancer or struggling with it right now. And, you know, there's a lot of scars and a lot of things going on in the body. And for some people, it's, they've been stuck in what they term, quote unquote, the fat suit for years and years and years. Um, and for a lot of people, it's a, a challenge with looking in the mirror and always wanting to be somewhere else or somebody else. But it, the the weight thing will come and it will come as a beautiful consequence of you feeling in balance. It'll come as a consequence of you feeling that self-esteem boost, that level of intu- in, intuition with trusting in your own body and feeling acceptance with it. So... I think that we have to find how to love ourselves right this moment. And that, you know, isn't that the question of the century? How to be in the now? You know, like yeah. who's <laughs> I have that tattooed on my wrist now. And um, it's a good reminder that you can't be somewhere other than you are in this moment. Yeah, and it goes back to really, you know, presence is everything. And also, too, you know, we have to accept that the body that we want to have might be different than the body that we're meant to have and where our body wants to be and that's okay yeah and that that is a practice that's a challenge it's really challenging for me all the time still but I'm way better today with that than I was you know a month ago a week ago I feel like I'm always getting better but it's still a challenge and I think you know I don't know how long it will be for but I think it we it's a yeah like you said it's a self-esteem issue and it's an issue of being okay with ourselves being in the present because we can't 
dislike ourselves if we're really in the present moment, I think. I think it's it's comparison that makes us really go crazy. It's, you know, like you were saying, when you were on the beach comparing your body to other women's bodies, it's comparing ourselves to our past selves, what we were in the past, and fear of the future. I think that's what really, like, stirs up a lot of this body stuff. And knowing that health can be achieved at any size. It doesn't have anything to do with our weight. There are people who are in larger bodies who are perfectly healthy and I think that that's just such an important crucial thing to remember and keep in mind and help in loving yourself naked wherever you are in this moment while you're listening to this yes so you brought up just a little teaching that I often do that reminds me here there's an important distinction when we're thinking about being present with where we're at right now for some people that I've worked with there immediately comes up a fear of, but wait a minute, if I accept myself or quote unquote surrender to the now and I accept myself for where I am right now, isn't that like giving up? And there's a really, really important lesson in here. It's a, it's actually the art of surrender is letting go of control and allowing yourself to feel uh, trust that it's all going to work out for your best and highest good in, in, in whatever way that looks. And so when you surrender to acceptance of where you're at right now, it's the opposite of giving up. It's actually you saying, yes, I'm okay with things to change. Um, where the distinction sometimes comes is sometimes people think, well, gosh, but if I'm, I accept where I'm at right now, then I'm always going to be this way. And so what then, then we do is then we stay in the fight and we stay in all of the running and running and running and we come right back to our mind and we come right back to the thought. And I, my belief is that most people that I work with, and this includes myself, right, <laughs> is that uh, one of the biggest addictions we have in our world is addiction to the mind and addiction to our incessant thought. And so a lot of the times when we are stuck in the thought, I mean, we're in that state of addiction because it's more comfortable to be thinking because if we're thinking, then we can feel like we're in control. And when we're in reality, we really don't have any control. Um, and the paradox here is we want control. Right? So, you know, there's a few, few important things. One is to know that when you keep thinking and thinking and trying to get out of it or trying to find a way, uh, that's just the, it's the opposite of enlightenment. The enlightenment comes from, or the miracle, so to speak, is the shift in perception of I can be okay with how I am now. And a very simple example of that. So today I went ice skating and I used to, I grew up on a, like a canal and on the water. And so I used to ice skate a lot my whole life. Um, but it's probably been 15 years since I've put on a pair of ice skates. So today in out of my comfort zone moment, and my little niece wanted me to skate with her without her using this little contraption they put on the ice that helps her to learn. I was like, sure, you know, so I, she's like three, so I'm bent over and I'm skating with her and I start to slip and I fall and I catch her so she doesn't hurt herself and I bang my knee really hard on the ice. So I'm limping around my house now, <laughs> which is whatever, you know, it, it's a bummer. I'm going to be okay. But what's the the reality here is and it's a simple example but i'm in pain walking upstairs hurts really bad and so my mind wants to be like you're so stupid i can't believe you blah 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 oh you're gonna not be able to do yoga this week. you know right and i'm so stuck in the in the mindset of my pain my pain my pain my pain where the practice of being in the now is more of a curious state wow isn't this interesting? Like, okay, so this is what pain feels like. So this is what it feels like when your knee hurts. And what it's, it's a, a simple, simple step, almost a sidestep to not attaching meaning to the source of our pain. It just is. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to solve it. It just is. And when we're there, we can feel free. And so I don't know, hopefully that makes sense, but I think a lot of people can relate that to being in their body. Mm, yeah, that was great. I think that it's so important to talk about 
because you're right. I love what you said about the addiction to the thoughts in our mind and letting those run the show and the illusion of control. And I think there's, and you know, that's why religion exists. That's why spirituality exists. It's to help people with the fact, come to terms with the fact that we're not in control of anything. We're not in control of our weight or the way our body looks. We're not in control of, we have zero control. It's all an illusion and we all want to think that we have control. And it's about really becoming okay with the fact that we aren't in control and that's okay. We're going to be okay. And it's, it's really good to have conversations like this to remind us of that. Yeah. And becoming okay with that reality. It's so good. So you told me last time we hung out that you are really focusing on doing things that are outside of your comfort zone. So when did that begin? And tell us a few that you've done recently and why and why it's important for people to do things outside of their comfort zone. When did it begin? I don't, I don't know. I Here's the thing is I feel feel since I was younger that I've had teachers in my life that have uh, pushed me in that regard in, in this sense. So I have two fathers. Uh, stepfather I met when I was five and then my biological father and I love them both dearly. Very lucky. And you know as a young girl I would dive into the water behind our house and I would be rated by my, uh, not be rated, but I was, he ra- <laughs> he was rating me and on how my diving expertise was, you know? So he's like, that was a nine, <laughs> that was a 8.5. And I, I never really got a 10, right? <laughs> and so I think it gave me a little bit of a competitive edge and I played sports here or there. I mean, I was like the girl, though, who smoked weed and then I played sports. So, <laughs> and um, what I, I started to see is that the things outside of me, I want to make sure I put this correctly. So, like, the things I was reaching for outside of me that were my comfort zones, like, um, in some cases, food, or in some cases, back then I, when I used to smoke pot all the time. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but it was just something that I think I abused back then. Um, even drinking for a while or, um, you know, I was a very, very addicted to work for a, in mo- most of my 20s. And so I was looking for this sense of fulfillment and value from things outside of me a lot. And I don't know where I picked that up, but I I misinterpreted that that was part of my competitive edge. And so what I started to see is that the way I could really grow myself and connect more to myself, one is through movement, so moving my body in various ways. I'm not like a gym rat kind of person, so I've, you know, I just not. And I like to do lots of different physical things, so I, I try to do new things to keep me, you know, I like pole dancing. I have a pole in my bedroom, <laughs> and uh, it's like great physical fitness and fun. Fun is my favorite word. So, you know, doing something that feels like it can push my edge in one way will help me in so many other ways in my life. You know, being an entrepreneur is one of the best gifts ever. I love it. And... Come, coming with that is a lot of things that push your edge a lot. And and so if I can do fun activities, not that running a business isn't fun, but I think you guys know what I mean. <laughs> if I can do like fun activities like go climbing a rock wall somewhere or um, going to a new, you know, I've traveled a lot on my own in my life and, you know, doing things that I typically would not do. I, coming to mind is that one particular event you and I went to with our friend Anne. <laughs> <laughs> never been to that kind of a show before just it's just random stuff it's just random stuff it because so what ha- fun. It, it was it was and and surrendering to being really present and seeing how it all unfolds I think that's part what I really get high on now is the synchronicity of like how is this all going to unfold and can I be in the present here and not be attached to how it's going to go like and and take away the meaning of any of it just be here and experience it and what I notice is that when I push myself a little bit constantly through doing these type, different types of things here or there, it helps me so much in my life. Like I can't even begin to describe it. Like it's 
it's awesome. So I don't know if I have necessarily a list, but I have, you know, the dream book and the, the vision board and all the things that I want to do on there. And, and now so that I'm a cool. mom, jumping out of a plane feels a little different, you know, like yeah. I, <laughs> maybe still, I don't know. We'll see. That's so cool. And I'm excited to do things out of my comfort zone with you. Yeah. What's cool is you just brought this up to me that just kind of hit me like a little aha for myself is I have a very rebellious uh, heart. You know, there's a part of me that loves being a rebel, that wants to do things different. That Now there's a different way or a different opportunity for me to transmute that rebellious energy and it's a, it feels much healthier. Hopefully that comes yeah, across. It's That's another way yeah. to use that energy. Yes. I love that. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Because I think we have excess energy that we have to get out in some way. And sometimes, you know, it's doing a workout or doing something outside of your comfort zone or, you know, trying a new thing or calling a friend. But we have to – it has to go somewhere. And it might go into an old – negative behavior if and a and t- that's you know really ingrained deeply in us if we don't actively try to put it somewhere else yes so i think that's important to discuss and mention and i love that so what is your favorite part of your life right now great question i feel so I was just having dinner with my boyfriend who moved here to be with me from Philadelphia. And we've been together for a few years. And my son, we're, three of us were together. And the wave of just massive gratitude came over me. You know, we're eating great dinner, good music's playing. We're all laughing hysterically at something silly. And it... Uh, it just, I feel really content in my body, in my life. I feel like I'm in a state where I've attracted a core group of friends that is expanding right now too, that I really feel like I they can meet me where I'm at. And um, so a few things that come to, I guess relationships is, would be the short answer. <laughs> mm. You know, the relationships that I've been able to cultivate which in my is life. the most important thing, I think, in life. Yeah, yeah. And your and, relationship to yourself. Yes. And that's, and, and here's the thing is when I met my boyfriend, I, I was dating a bunch of people. I didn't anticipate dating him. We just kind of met in passing. But I really was working on – my goal was to be whole. You know, <laughs> I had felt like I, I lived such a life of – lot of codependency in my life and so I just wanted to be whole and so I have this sense of kind of bliss like okay crazy shit has happened in the last couple years no doubt about it like (laughs) there's been some tough moments but through it all I've been able to maintain this connection to myself that I didn't realize existed a few years back so that's really something I'm grateful for. That's great. I I think it, it really the relationships that you have is really a testament to the work you've been doing on yourself. So now I want to ask you um, the questions that I ask everyone. So what does your morning routine? What do your morning routines look like now? And um, well, actually, let me take a step back before we get to that. We have a lot of mothers listening to the podcast, and I want to take advantage of the fact that you're a mother to Manny, who's adorable and super cool. And I want to know what is what are some of your tips for being a mother? And I don't even want to use the word balance because I think balance can be kind of a myth or like a cliche word, but finding your flow with being a mother and making sure that you're taking care of yourself to be an example for him and also taking care of him in a healthy, holistic way. Just could you speak on that? I know that's really open-ended, but I think you can do it. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. So the first thing is that just popped in was allowing myself and others that are really close to me the space to really feel emotions fully. So um, what I've noticed since becoming a mother that 
this things go really really fast and you're doing so many different things and I basically started my business when I was pregnant so like I <laughs> and, and finished just up a you know part of nutrition school at the same time so I had a lot going on at one time and I you know it's the same story most entrepreneurs tell like I totally went into adrenal fatigue etc cetera, etc cetera, and learned some lessons from that and part of that experience was me racing through and not allowing myself the space to experience the full range of emotions that I I was having and there was a lot of them and when I say the space I'm not saying I need to like kick back on the couch all day and like do nothing although that is important too <laughs> however um, it was just really about slowing down my brain and I'll give some tips maybe in the morning routine question how I do yeah. that but you know what I realized though is that I was a perfect mirror reflection to how my son was showing up and so part of the way that I got that gift I mean that's the gift I think of parenthood is your children will show you what you need to work on <laughs> and so I started to see my son uh, not necessarily feeling all his emotions and you know at his age at the time it was like three or four it was a little different because he didn't know how to name all these crazy sudden emotions that he's probably feeling for the first time in his entire life, yeah, right? He drops something right. on his toe and he's never had that pain before, yeah, right? Like, you don't know how long it's going to be there and it yeah. must feel so exaggerated the first time. Yeah. And so what it started to teach me was like, holy shit, like when I was young, I don't know that I learned how to fully feel all these emotions either. And I didn't always get you know, of course my parents did the best they could, but I didn't always get the tools that I needed. And so that's why I reached for other substances to, to numb it. And so that's my biggest thing as a parent is um, honoring your emotions, trying to name them, giving yourself the space to feel them. And what it's allowed me to do is to show up more present, which is really the biggest thing that Manny wants from me. He wants my presence. He wants my eye contact. And I want to give that to him and if I don't, I think all parents listening probably have had that moment where they weren't present and then we feel like shit about it, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, that that's probably one of the biggest, and, and having fun, like, you know, I, I think it's really, really fun to be in touch with your kid inside and so that he's a reminder to me to not take things so freaking seriously because <laughs> I do a lot. I, I can be like I'm a Virgo. I'm like very meticulous sometimes, and I can be too serious. So he reminds me to be a little silly. Mm. I love that. I think it's important. Um, one thing you said there of like all kids want from you is your presence, and I can really feel that even looking back thinking of being a kid myself and that was all I ever wanted from my mom you know from my parents from any adults around me any people around me and now as a big kid it's all I still want from yeah. people is their <laughs> presence is to be seen is to be heard is to be listened to is to be followed is to be shared liked accepted that's all we ever want so as kids it's just accentuated because it's the you know it's the first time feeling that so that's so great that you picked up on that and um manny's really lucky to have such a cool mom thank you so all right now let's go to the morning routine question so how are how do you start your mornings what are maybe the first few things you do when you wake up in the morning and how does that affect how the rest of your day goes so i slam water the first thing i do like i'm at like a beer chugging contest <laughs> but but with water so that always happens um, my son is with his dad a lot of the time and so I have I feel almost like I live a couple different lives so but at the same time there's my life feels a little different so there's certain moments I wake up he's not here he's with his dad and I have more quote unquote time uh, not like there's a ton of it right but I can sit in a 30-minute meditation versus a five-minute meditation. So that varies a little bit, but I always do a meditation. And it, it varies whether it's led by uh, my breathing or if it's primordial sound or transcendent. I mean, I do a lot of different types of things there. I do some kind of... Um, 
morning moving something. And these are, again, like a few minutes. So I may just stretch and touch my toes, and sometimes it's more than that. I'm not always excellent at working out in the morning, like fully. I'd like to be better at that, but that's it's just random for me when I move my body in terms of the time of day. And then breakfast is a non-negotiable. I have really great breakfasts. So I make that a really big priority. So it's vegetables, um, green smoothie, green juice, and whatever, you know, whatever is in my my refrigerator. I basically find a way to make up. And music or some kind of a uh, something while I'm driving, if I'm by myself. If I'm with my son, I'm taking him to school. And he loves when I tell him stories. And this is also something that like goes into the out of my comfort zone. I'm a, I'm a writer that needs to probably write her book more, right? Like it's going to be out in the next year and that'll be exciting. But I've, I've been writing it for like four or five years because <laughs> I didn't have a deadline. And so what he has done is he has me tell him stories. And so now I'm forced to come up with these really elaborate stories. And I have to admit, they're really good. So mm-hmm. I... <laughs> I we started recording them, and so I tell him stories for our thirty minute his drive. Our his school is a bit of a drive, and then I listen to something almost every day, like a podcast, Wellness Wonderland, mm-hmm. or um, you know some kind of a. I, I love Audible, so I listen to a ton of stuff. Me too. On there, that's those are my favorite things. What are some of your favorite books you've listened to recently? Ooh, good question. Um, let's see. Um, Marie Kondo oh, I, yeah. I, I just comes to mind. Yeah, because that was like... changing magic of tidying up. Yeah, so that was like my whole year last year. I was, yeah, was so re-listening good. to that. And I'm, I'm mostly done. But, you know, I've, I'm Marie kondo my whole house last year. So that was a big one. I, I have listened to... Um, Gosh, none are coming to mind right now. It's kind of weird. I'm at a blank. We're recording this on a Sunday, so I'm like in down mode. But (laughs) that's uh, I love that book. And for anyone who wants to get a free audio book, click the link in the show notes and check out Audible. I'm a huge fan as well. My I was just like gazing at my library the other day in Audible, and I was like, this is solid. I have read slash listened heard (laughs) so many books. It was like I was like, wow, there's a lot of information in here. So yes. I love Audible. It's so effective. This is not like meant to be an ad at all. This is just totally organic. No. But I love listening to books while I'm folding laundry or driving or cooking. It's just nice to be able to multitask while you're learning or just entertaining yourself. I like to listen to a lot of fiction on there too. Yeah, I'm, and some are coming to mind now as you're saying this because, first of all, um, I do drive a decent amount, and so I was realizing that for years I kind of stopped reading because I just didn't make the time to sit around and read a book, right? And so I'm averaging maybe two books a month, give or take. I mean, it depends on the month, but that's a good average, sometimes more, because of Audible. And I'm not an affiliate or anything like you. I'm just like absolutely love it. So, you know, I listen to um. One of the coolest things is they they have something on there called the courses. I think it's called the the courses or something. I'll have to look up what it's called. But essentially, I'm like learning about neurobiology. <laughs> I'm listening to all these really amazing courses from cool. these renowned people. I'm kind of a geek when it comes to that stuff and science. And, um, you know, I listen to like mom books on like raising, you know, raising your kids to fun like big magic i read that one elizabeth so gilbert good. michael singer is one of i like him he wrote the untethered soul and then i just finished the surrender experiment recently oh, so that, cool. that's a really good one what are some of your favorite parenting books or any parenting tips hmm so one that i like the book, one of the books I'm reading right now or listening to right now, it's called Hold On to Your Kids. And I have I think the guy's last name, it's uh, Mate, M-A-T-E, is the author. And he co-wrote it with a, another gentleman whom I can't remember his last name right now. And it's a it's probably for targeted for people who have a little bit older children than mine. But what's interesting is they talk about this paradigm of 
the culture we live in now and how a lot of children are raised more so from their peers than they are their their parents. Ooh. Yeah, and I, I can re- I really I'm listening to this thinking like that was me. Yeah, same. <laughs> totally, right? And and how, you know, many people can feel especially as, as me who was I felt like I looked to my peers for their advice more so than I did my yeah, parents. Definitely. The, the part of what they're talking about is that this has become a cultural issue and why we have a lot of people who are uh, dealing with so much more anxiety and so much more uh, levels of stress because they don't feel like they have that connection to, on a very primal level, their tribe. What I started realizing is that I I want to create this uh, safe and secure environment for my child where he knows that um, I'm always there first. And I want to give him this like loving permission to have these great friends, but that if he needs advice or needs something that it doesn't, you know, that the instinct is to come to mom or dad or whomever first in the family than to go to the friends. Because you think about, you know, a friend raising a friend or a peer raising a peer. Blind, isn't leading is it, the blind. Yeah. <laughs> even though it seems fun for the, you know, at the time, it's probably not always a good thing. So, yeah, that that's a good that's a really and bo- the other thing that comes to mind. I've read so many books and children's stuff on on boundaries and and that kind of stuff. And setting clear boundaries is so important right now because we live in this culture that's so inundated with so much noise all the time. And even the generation my son is about to grow up in, you know, he knows how to work the iPhone better than his grandparents, and so. <laughs> Um, and it just seems very normalized to him to like we live near a Google headquarters where I live and we passed it the other day. Again. He's like, oh, my gosh, mommy, Google's here. <laughs> oh. And I realized how he just knows Google so easily. And and so uh, if we don't have clear boundaries of and and a, a way for ourselves and our children to be able to focus their attention on what is in front of them then they're going to be like all over the place. (laughs) So that's really important. Oh, that's so good. I'm so glad we covered this because this is just an area that I've gotten some feedback recently that I kind of glossed over because I'm not a parent yet. Yeah. But it's so fascinating to me. And there's so many people who are listening who are parents and or will be parents um, someday. So it's it's really good to talk about. And this stuff is just fascinating to me. I was just talking to a friend earlier today about how it's interesting how much children pick up like Velcro from us and you really have to make sure we have all of our stuff in check, like your body image stuff and yeah. your, um, you know, addictive patterns and your all of our issues. They're just going to pick up and recreate if, if we don't first take care of them ourselves. So I, I really want to talk more about it on the show and make an effort to bring it up more. So I'm glad we're we're having this conversation and it's coming up right now. Yeah. You, when we when we met, like, hanging out as friends last time, too, I think we talked a lot about that kind of conversation. And what it reminds me of, too, is whether someone has children or not, it's such a good thing to chat about because it allows us to access memory points from our childhood and do a little bit of, you know, investigation or healing yeah. or, you know, just awareness of, wow, that happened to me or... It can be really cool. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. By healing, by working on your relationship and your parenting, you're actually able to deal with some of your own stuff from childhood and bring that up as well. Yeah. That's fascinating. It is. So let's get to the other end of that question. So what are the last few things you do at the end of the day and your evening routines and how that affects um, your sleep and how you relax after, especially being an entrepreneur? So most recently, I committed to yoga every damn day. And uh, that doesn't mean I show up to a yoga class every day. I wish that I did that, but I'm not yet. So I, but I commit to doing a little yoga every day. And that seems to continue on right before I go to sleep. So I'll do some kind of yoga, like right at the foot of my bed, basically. Then I do magnesium. There's something 
about magnesium that loves my body and I love it. So I do either a drink of mag this magnesium drink called Natural Calm, stress relief, great stuff. I'll either drink some of that or I take these good pills that have a bunch of other like B vitamins and other fun things in there too. But I'll take that and get my body. You know, I, one, I wash my face every night without fail. I do little rituals that have become habitual for me that just make me feel like, ah, oh, calm, complete. <laughs> Um, putting little oil on my cuticles. So I, I'm not perfect at this one, but I try to put lotion on my hands and my feet. I live in Michigan, so it gets cold. So you got to do that kind of stuff. And, you know, brush my teeth, put my little mouth guard in. You know, because sometimes I get lazy and I don't want to do those, all that stuff. You know, I'm like, oh, do I have to wear my mouth thing? <laughs> you know, and so I find that I feel really good in my body. I try to keep the phone away from me. I'm not always great at that, but I'm I'm better than I probably ever have been where I put it on airplane mode and I go to sleep with either just calming sense of breathing and and presence or I'll read a some, you know, a little bit of something, but usually Facebook before sleep or Twitter doesn't amount to me. I dream like crazy dreams and like huge dreams. <laughs> probably could write massive great movies from them if I wrote them down. And so I try to keep all the crap out of my head before I fall asleep so it doesn't disrupt my dreams. <laughs> I feel you. I, yeah. I always think that. I was like, whoa, I could write some crazy, interesting thriller after dreams that I've had before. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, it's it's it makes me grateful for how much of imagination I have. But – it's um, it's definitely interesting to know that like I don't know how peaceful my rest was. I know is, <laughs> because that was pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to some quick fire questions. Are you ready for them? Yes. So you're trapped on a deserted island, and you can only bring with you one TV show season to binge watch, one book, one person, and one food. Go. Okay, so person, Rob Scott. Oh, man, that's hard, though, because I'd want to bring my son in. One person. Okay. You can bring them both. All right, good. <laughs> Those are my boys. Um, the book, I just mentioned The Untethered Soul, so that one just comes to mind. It's awesome. I have read it do half a dozen times, probably. Um, TV show. I don't watch a ton of TV, although I just binge-watched uh, – what is, what is it even called? Um, the Royals, which is not a typical show I would ever watch, but I think I needed like some, you know, it, like fun, fun something. And I watched like two episodes or not two episodes, two seasons of it in like a weekend or something insane. Fun. So I would be, I would bring something fun that would not be typical for me. So I would remember on my island to just enjoy. Um, what else did you ask me? So food. It was food. Oh, good question. Stranded on a dessert, I would bring bananas because that's that can sustain you. That's the one food that can sustain you forever, and you wouldn't really need anything else. And they taste good, so I'd probably just bring those guys. And they might have them already on the island, so you can yeah. bring like yeah. pizza or chocolate <laughs> too. <laughs> so um, what's the hardest time you've ever laughed or some time you laughed really hard recently that you can think of? Oh, um crying laughter would be with my boyfriend Rob he he's really good at making me laugh I can't remember okay I'll just share this story so um we were in the kitchen this was at my old place that I used to live and like I walked up to him and we were like doing dishes and just finished eating and it was one of those moments where you're like trying to look all sexy as a woman and like Hey, you know, the, the whole thing. And I'm like in the kitchen and he's like coming up towards me. And I was trying to play hard to get and, you know, be fun. And I'm backing up and backing up and he's like walking towards me. And I didn't realize that the dishwasher was like open. And oh, yeah. no. <laughs> so I fell literally on top of the whole like dishwasher, like the racks fell, you know, <laughs> 
<laughs> looking back on it, it I, I oh my gosh, at oh. the time we were crying, laughing, and I felt like I was going to pee my pants because oh, that's so funny. Yeah, and so now him and my son make these little jokes, and they'll like look at me, and then they just like start walking backwards, and then they go whoa, whoa, whoa and pretend they fall, Aww. you know. <laughs> so. I'm I'm a bit of a klutzy person. I've always been that way. So I I have a lot of funny moments of falling. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I love that. Yeah. So what's the best meal you've eaten recently? The best meal I've eaten recently, I went to a place called In Season Cafe yesterday, and one of my favorite things that they have is like this cashew ginger veggie and the brown, stir fry? Brown, yeah, the stir fry. Oh, it's so good. I always get that too. I know. It's, I could eat it every day. Yeah. And I, yeah, I just love good flavors, rice and veggies. It's probably my go-to. It doesn't sound that exciting as I say it that way, but it tastes so no, good. No, my favorite foods are like warm bowls with like a vegetable and a good sauce and mm-hmm. a rice or a quinoa situation. Yes. And like yeah. lots of veggies. Like I would take that over like even like a really great amazing cold salad or smoothie or anything like everything else ever. Like I I'm love totally a warm you. bowl like that. It's yeah. the best. And my body likes warm food more yeah. than it likes cold food. I yeah. So I'm with you. Yeah, 100%. me too. Um, so. so we talked about what your favorite part of your life is right now. What is something that you're struggling with and you're challenging yourself with and you're working towards? So kind of playing off what I was sharing earlier about my uh, son, just really being able to fully feel the range of emotions. I, would, I wouldn't say I'm really struggling with this right now, but I was definitely struggling, struggling with it a year ago right now. And... So right now I feel like I'm just in this place of allowing myself to really, uh, I'm doing a lot of, I teach emotional healing with a lot of people who do my advanced sugar addiction course. And so I'm upping my game there basically is what I'm, I'm focused on is allowing myself to get to the root of some of my deeper emotions and to let them go. And express what I need to express and what's been helpful for me in doing that is uh, doing a lot of visualizations and uh, kind of med you know to me meditation is not without thought but some of these I'll call like a, a visualization slash meditation where I'm meditating on being in a blissful place and you know <laughs> you know like the balloon floating away with some mm-hmm. of the stuff inside I mean like to do a quick version of it but I'm doing a lot of that, like as a in a repetitive way, almost diligently, maybe not every day, but close to it. And it's helped me profoundly. Oh my goodness. So yeah, growing up growing up in myself a little bit. <laughs> what are you've been an entrepreneur for most of your life and in the last seven years in this business, but what are some of the biggest lessons or tips you can give about having your own business and being an entrepreneur and being a girl boss? Yeah, girl boss. So big thing, this is huge. Focus on one freaking thing and get it done and see it all the way through. And I say this because that's not what I did. I was, I was like, oh, my God, I have so many ideas. It's like total creative. Oh, let's yes. do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. And not to say I'm not happy about it. You know, I have created a lot of different online programs and a lot of cool things I'm proud of. But when I look back, and there's no regrets, but I think I could have probably three or four years ago uh, done things a little differently had I just taken – the one thing and figured it out fully, like really stripped it down and found all the little nuances to really make that thing. And and it's not that I didn't think I, back then, I thought I did that, (laughs) but I just didn't spend enough time really diving deep and digging into it. And so that's where I'm at right now. And I'm very, and it takes some focus because my attention wants to get pulled, but I just keep coming back and it forces me to say no to a lot more things. So I'm constantly saying no to people. Can't do that. Sorry. I can't have my time because <laughs> I got to I got to see this one one thing. That's so True. helpful yeah. and I 
relate to that a lot. That's definitely something that I struggle with. I want, I have, I'm an idea person, so I have all these ideas. I want to start like 10 podcasts and I, I want to write 10 <laughs> books. And then I also want to do a bunch of other stuff. And there's only so much time and bandwidth. So that's such an important point to make. And I'm, that's fantastic advice. And I needed it. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's always good for me to share it too. It's a little reminder and the kick in the pants. To <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we're having a dinner party, and you can invite five people. Who would you invite? What would you make for them to eat? And what do you hope someone would ask you at the party? And what do you hope someone turns and doesn't ask you that you Mm. just don't want to talk about anymore? And I can invite five people? Five people. That's correct. Okay. So um, Martin Luther King, I would invite him. I would invite Mark Twain. I would invite uh, Carolyn Mace. I, she's an author, teacher now. Medical just, intuitive. Yeah, she's kind of like a someone I really look up to. I like her a lot. Um, I would def. I, I would invite Oprah. I would invite a bum off the street. Mm. And um, and the and what was it? what I would hope someone would ask me or, or not yes, ask me? both. Okay. Um, I, I, I would hope someone would ask me, if I'm really honest, about myself. <laughs> because I feel like I just, I, if I'm sitting around all these people, I'd want to be able to be seen by them in a way where they could just see who I was as a person. You know, not like, tell them the story of like, oh, I'm so cool, you know, not that way, but just like I would want them to see my vulnerability. So I really don't know what the question would be, but, you know, they could ask me something where I could feel human (laughs) with all of these really interesting people and uh, make sure that I don't have them up on a pedestal, you know, like it would just be like a, a table of humanity of great people with lots to offer sitting around and meeting people heart to heart, soul to soul type of thing. What would I not want them to ask me? Oh, these are great questions. I, I'd have a hard, there's some, there's racism that is in my family and, uh, like, you know, I won't go into too much detail. Some of the family's still alive, but, um, it's really been a great, service to me in a sense because it forced me to make some really tough decisions in my life of saying I'm going to be family with all of my family and if you don't like it then uh, because you know my family has different culture and and different race and ethnicities in it now by marriage and so I basically had to say to a certain family like hey if you don't want if you don't like that I'm family with this family, then don't be my family anymore. And it was really hard to do that at a young age. And, you know, that's why I, I look to Martin Luther King. You know, I, I find that that's a big deal in our world is people seeing others as separate. So it'd be hard for me, I think, to share the shame of where I come from in a, in a sense. But also, it'd be somewhat healing too, you know, knowing that that's made me who I am. Yeah, race is such a relevant topic always, but especially in our current culture, and there's so much going on around it currently that I think that it's important to have conversations about it, and it's important to realize, and something that I've been realizing personally is just how how much we, we don't think about things that are really important, and we don't think about necessarily about race when it might not affect us on a normal day-to-day basis it might not be part of our consciousness but it is because it's so deeply ingrained in our society and our culture that it is something that we need to examine and look at I know for myself and and a lot of people so that's really noble of you to bring up and know that that's important and and bring it up in in this conversation yeah Thank you. Yeah, it's it's something, you know, I say thank you in the sense just like for recognizing that, but it's something I'm just totally exploring still as I see the hashtags Black Lives Matter and the, you know, um, other hashtags like 
white privilege and in I was born outside of Detroit where there is a decent amount of of that happening, right? Of of different types of racial conversations. And I was born a white chick, you know, that wasn't by choice. Like I didn't know that. <laughs> but when you when I know where a lot of the roots of my family came from, um, it certainly just impacted me in the way that I have chosen to see the world as what's underneath all of our skin. And I don't know necessarily even where I'm going with this, but I, I, I feel like it's really important that we start to see all people. Yeah, and this is an entirely, we're like at the end of the podcast yeah, and bringing up like, like an entirely new topic that I yeah. personally don't even feel like remotely qualified to tackle. But it's, <laughs> but it's reminding me that... I want to talk about it more and I want to have an expert on um, about this and about talking about topics like this because I think it is important for, for everyone to hear. And so at least this was a little like a, alluding yeah. to that, but it's not, yeah, we're not going to get that, into it right now. <laughs> give that podcast a listen when you have it on. <laughs> totally. So what is your favorite thing to cook for people? What would you cook if you were having a dinner party? I would definitely cook some kind of, it'd probably be a stir fry type of thing. You know, I, I like healthy desserts too. I'm really good at fun smoothies. There, it'd probably be a, like a smorg, how do you say that word? Smorgasbord? Smorgasbord, yeah. Yeah, I love that word. Um, I would probably be a whole different bunch of things, you know, fun little chocolates and treats and warm foods and stuff like that. Fun. Buffet. That that all sounds delicious. Mm Mm-hmm. So recommend something in the category of movie, either a movie you've seen recently or a movie you've always loved, anything. Shoot, okay. The movie I just saw recently, I can't remember. Gosh, you have great questions. I can't remember the name. Maybe somebody will remember it. Um, Brad, Brad Pitt was in it, and it was basically the... uh, story of how the government and our financial system got majorly corrupt so bad right now can't remember the name of it so you're not going to really get it's okay people can yeah. google yeah they can google <laughs> cool i'll yeah. have to see it yeah it but really it put in perspective for me why you know where i want to invest my money and it just recently came out i mean this was yeah, um, I think oh, oh i remember the big yeah. the big short the oh, big okay. short. Cool. Yeah. Stumbling on my words and there it is. So I would see the big short. Big cool. one. Cool. I'm bummed you saw it or I, we could go together. Let's go <laughs> see another movie soon. Okay. I would love it. So what's a song that you would like to recommend? Either one that you've always loved or something that you can't stop listening to right now. Anything in that category. <laughs> I'm not a super religious person. Definitely very spiritual. So I don't know where this comes from, but somehow my son and I just recently discovered Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack, and um, <laughs> we've been listening to it and having dance parties all Aww. the time. Yeah. So I love show tunes. Yeah. So that comes to mind. That's Fun. something something that brings you to dance That's and super let go. Mm-hmm. I love that. So cool. So as you know, the name of this podcast and the name of my blog is The Wellness Wonderland. So when I offer that term to you to live in a wellness wonderland, what does that mean to you, Renee? What comes up? I love the name of that, by the way. It reminds me of like step opening the door to like living in this cloud and um, being able to really create and self-author whatever you want once you're inside. And I love that. Mm, I do too. So go ahead and just tell people where they can find you and um, how they can get in touch with you. So people, can, if they want to know more about me as Renee and all the things that I'm doing, go to ReneeHeigel.com, R-E-N-E-E-H-E-I-G-E-L.com. And then if you want details on how to break up with your addiction to sugar, on cravings, or retraining your taste buds, go to WinningTheSugarGame.com winning the sugar game. So those are the two places. And pretty much on all social media, I'm Renee Heigl. So you can find me pretty much everywhere. Thank you so much for being here and being my friend. I think you're awesome, like I said. And this was so much fun. It was. I love you. This is awesome. 
All right, there you have it, my conversation with Renee Heigl. If you want a free audiobook, check it out. Link in the show notes. If you want to join the Facebook group and talk about this episode and meet other people who listen to the podcast, also link in the show notes. Subscribe, share it with a friend, help out the show through Amazon, maybe donate. I love you guys. Do what you do you with how you want to support the show. So many options. Thank you, Renee. Tweet at us both to let us know you listened. And I'll talk to you guys really soon. Oh, sign up for my email newsletter because I'll let you know who's coming up on the show next week when I send that out periodically, which is very inconsistent because I've just been very busy and traveling and and haven't been consistent with it. But I promise it probably will be consistent again at some point. So sign up. Love you. Very long-winded and weird outro. But if you're still listening, tweet me like the corn emoji because that's a weird one.